Okay, an interesting news story emerged this week. Uh, job listings for the uh, sequel to Cyberpunk 2077 have emerged. And uh, the key talking point seems to be that CD Projekt Red is aiming to deliver, quote unquote, the most realistic cra crowds ever seen in a video game. Now, on the one hand, you might think, you know, big deal. But on the other hand, when you think about the... Um, the believability of an open world, it very much comes down to not just the world itself, but how it's inhabited, right? You know, the, what's happening with the, the people that live in this world. And I think for my money, it's still basically Rockstar who've done the best with NPCs on that front. They do some pretty amazing stuff going all the way back to like GTA 4. Um, Alex, this news story has a number of sort of hints about what's happening with the next cyberpunk, but I'm curious what you'd make of all of this. Uh, well, I'm interested uh, kind of how it's maybe going to remedy some of the criticisms of the of Cyberpunk 2077, where I, I really like that game. And uh, I think the world on a visual level, as you're going through it, is very, very compelling. But there's a number of moments, and I think even John highlighted this in his <laughs> original video, where you could just like, you can really often turn a corner and then walk back, like not even five seconds later, and all of a sudden the NPCs there are completely different. Or you <laughs> right. could, uh, you know, go, turn a corner or just even watch in a distance and you'll see just cars just like appear, right? And it seems like almost like the last topic about AI, like the game just didn't have a good memory or persistence for the actual NPCs in the world. And they were just kind of like spawned in random things at a location to fill it out in a visual also, manner. And they would their do behavior, be, you know, behavior was also weird, right? Yeah. It, like you, totally you can picture was. this, like the guy strutting down the street like this, and then he encounters something, and you see him like spin, rotate in place <laughs> while doing the same animation, then maybe getting stuck in a corner for a second and then rotating again and like never breaking that single animation cycle. <laughs> yeah, I could I, I can see it already in my head. You know, like the, the game's launch was really good for showing that off now. It's a little bit better now, um, but even then, just playing it recently for uh, DLSS Ray Reconstruction coverage, I found a number of moments where I was just like, what is the AI doing here? And I think that is probably for them in a world where they are trying to make an RPG and perhaps one that is a little bit less directed. Um, they want the NPCs to be much more reactive and persistent to allow for a greater level of interactivity in the world without it breaking down and falling into its easily visible constituent parts. And I think that is really amazing. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, though, to see if it will uh, leverage any of the technology we've been seeing demoed. Like when Oliver and I went to CES, we saw... Um, uh, a demo for a Korean Sims-like game, uh, the name of which escapes me, unfortunately, at the moment. Um, but they had, like, the normal game AI uh, that uh, was, you know, hard-coded, but then they had embellishments on it using machine learning that was running locally, actually, on the GPU. And I'm curious to see whether or not this most believable AI crowd's most believable AI uh, for the next cyberpunk game uh, would be leveraging any of these new frontiers of technology or if it would be traditional kind of, you know, NPC routines that we've seen ever since like Radiant uh, way back in the day. I I'd be curious to see what it is. I also kind of want to see games push more into what you said with GTA 4 did or even what um, like kind of what we saw with, oh, what's that Jedi game? Uh, the one back into the day. Uh, it's the one with Sam Witwer in it. Sorry. Oh, you mean uh, the Force Unleashed? Force Unleashed. Yeah, the Force Unleashed. Where you know, where like, where you know, they would kind of have contextual reactive animations of the stormtroopers. They like hang on to things if they were falling and stuff like that. Uh, I kind of really miss that in games. Uh, this right. kind of like level of ambition for simulation, and I would be curious to see if they're going to go in that some direction. There's today. also Cause yeah. There's also the opposite direction where it's all pure visual, but I still remember being impressed by Hitman Blood Money, uh, the New Orleans yeah. map. Yes, they're they are not very interactive, but that was like 20 years ago. And when you walk out into the street mm -hmm. and to see hundreds and hundreds of people walking around, and it worked on a PS2 even by the way. Uh, that's pretty mm -hmm. awesome, right? And you would kind of like to have seen that expanded and take advantage of more hardware and be more physically based. But I feel like crowds really didn't improve that much 
in a way that like they're not presented yeah. in a way that looks great. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, GTA four had, you know, so many little behaviors in there. The, the characters in there actually seem to be having like an, uh, a daily routine, for example, nice little reactive mm -hmm. stuff like uh, putting umbrellas up when it rains, getting morning coffee, that sort of stuff. That was really impressive stuff. Um, then of course, in terms of sheer density, we kind of pulled back from what happened in Assassin's Creed Unity um, for various reasons, uh, which was a bit of a mm -hmm. shame. I mean, but where do you go next? I mean, I think this is a crucial part of an open world game uh, that's set in a, in a big sprawling city. I mean, you think about Tokyo, for example, you think about the density of people mm -hmm. in there. It's, it's just like, you know, how would those people react to the kind of things that happen in cyberpunk? You know, that you want a kind of default level of activity that is, you know, convincing and realistic um, but you also want reactive behavior that you know actually makes sense you know mm -hmm. what actually happens when some of this crazy stuff that kicks off in cyberpunk occurs in a densely packed environment like that i think it could be transformative it could be amazing but the computational cost for that is going to be quite dramatically large and if we're factoring in ai models into all of that then um I do yeah. wonder whether the, the ultimate end game of that is probably going to be some sort of NVIDIA enhancement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, but, but, but we oh, shall no. see. Yeah. Though, um, as a quick aside, another game to keep an eye on for this kind of stuff though, that I highlighted last year is Kingmakers. Uh, because oh, of course, oh, right. which is the game that they're pouring a lot of effort into ensuring that the large crowds of enemies, uh, it's not like an open world crowd. It's actually like hostile, but their behavior, their physicality, the way they react to the player. Like when you go and look at all, all that early footage, I think it's some of the best looking like movement I've seen of a large group in any game to date. Right. So uh, there is at least something on the horizon there. Mm -hmm. That's a good point, John. Uh, so what do you make, uh, John, about this concept that the new cyberpunk isn't seemingly being developed by the Polish wing of CDPR? <laughs> seems to be being developed in North America. Um, is it Boston and Vancouver? Yeah. I mean, this could hint at a, at a very different game compared to what we've had already. Oh, for sure. And I, this, it, it's actually old news. I'd simply forgotten or maybe hadn't seen it before, right. but their new Boston studio. And they CD Projekt Red said specifically, this means Cyberpunk 2 will be more authentically American, end quote. Right. Uh, I'm not sure how I feel about that or what that actually means <laughs> in effect because uh, I'm, I don't know. There, there was a DNA to the types of things that CDPR has made in the past that felt very unique, if you will. Like it felt yeah. embedded in that company and that culture and the way that they worked. And yeah, definitely. This is essentially what you could say a different developer taking the reins and they absolutely could knock it out of the park. Uh, but there is definitely some concern yet also interest, I would say just to see what they come up with. But I'd say, say still today, the, the games that they've made like cyberpunk, the Witcher series, they don't really feel quite like anything else. Do they? Right. No, uh -huh. it's not the typical open world experience that you get. Uh, from most developers in the same way that I would argue when we've had like say Japanese and Chinese and other studios create their open world games, they also tend to play by slightly different rules and they feel different, right? Like the region does seem to matter in terms of what you end up with in terms of the overall feel and some of the design choices made, which I think is interesting. It adds like a nuance and sort of like this extra, like, you know, it, it's a positive thing. Um, but again, mm -hmm. it's way too early to to say anything good or bad one way or the other, right? Like, we don't know yet. I'm just fascinated that they've decided to essentially splinter and build up another uh, office, another studio, essentially, because clearly they're going to be busy with The Witcher 4 uh, at the original CD Projekt Red office, right? So I guess this is yeah. this is one way to increase development speed and actually get more games out the door because given the scope and the scale, it takes them a long time to make these games, right? So if Absolutely. they were going to do Cyberpunk 2 from the original studio, it would be like, what, 15 years before you might see it? Mm -hmm. 10, 15 yeah. years? I don't know. <laughs> so any final comments, Alex? 
Uh, but I, I'm actually curious that they chose to uh, leave the European continent for their new studios. Um, dude, you know, like the, you know, always when they talk about development in the United States, it's always uh, kind of focusing on that the cost of living there is uh, comparatively high, so salaries have to be a lot higher and um, things like that. So the efficient, the quote unquote money efficiency you get to from developing. Uh, like in Los Angeles versus developing in uh, Czech Republic, Poland, or something like that. It, it, I'm actually curious that they did choose to move to North America in that aspect instead of keeping it somewhere else in Central Europe. Um, but uh, that was their choice, and they probably had very good reasons for it that I have not proved. <laughs> uh, but I will, I will echo John that if you come from a certain place, and a lot of people in your development come from a certain place, it can lead to like a distinct flavoring of the mm -hmm. game uh, that you don't get elsewhere. And I would definitely say if you look at like the open world quest is like the narrative design in a lot of the Witcher games versus uh, one that would be made in North America or Japan, they often have a very different feel. And that's all, you know, something that's reflected in the product. So I'm curious to see what the spin would be on a cyberpunk game made in the United but at States least, and Canada. At least in this case, it is Boston and Vancouver, which is interesting. And there's there's actually a fair amount of game studios in Boston uh, still today. Right. And that's also where, back in the day, Irrational Games was based, uh, which is True interesting. That. So I'm wondering if there's going to be any cross-pollination DNA there where people that may have previously worked on some of those beloved titles end up working for this new CD Projekt Red studio. Mm -hmm, we'll see. Mm -hmm. Could be. Mm -hmm. Well, for one, I'm just glad uh, The Witcher remains in um, Poland for development. Uh, which, <laughs> yes. Which just makes sense, doesn't it?